The Rosicrucian Order, with its modern headquarters in San Jose, California, has for centuries been linked to Freemasonry. Well, you have to understand that Freemasonry is simply the modern-day manifestation of the ancient mystery of religions. The ideas of Masonry were, have been around literally for thousands of years. And, of course, Rosicrucianism uh, was simply a, a forerunner of modern-day Masonry. The Order takes its name from its primary symbol, the rose and cross. Like Masonry, the Rosicrucians trace their religion to the mysteries of ancient Egypt. Their power base in San Jose centers around an Egyptian museum. There are chapters of the Rosicrucians studying every place across America. And one only has to go up on the internet and you, they actually have websites where they recruit people into the Rosicrucian order. People have no idea that uh, these people are even here. Perhaps the reason for their lack of exposure is that they are dwarfed by the chief of all secret societies, the ancient order of Freemasonry. Nevertheless, the Rosicrucians are said to be the first of the secret orders to have opened a door in the New World. The very first that we know of, a cult beachhead in America, was Rosicrucian. I just, I was out on a speaking tour recently and I had the opportunity to visit the Ephrata Cloister, it's called, in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. And it's where the original Rosicrucian community built its, its headquarters, uh, right, right on the east coast of the United States. And that was in the 1600s. And right about the same time that Christianity was establishing its beachhead in America, so was the Rosicrucian order. In the 16th century, Sir Francis Bacon had become the chief of the Rosicrucians in England. Researchers believe that Bacon sent members of this society to America to launch his esoteric empire, the New Atlantis. This 1910 Newfoundland stamp commemorates Bacon's early influence. It reads, Lord Bacon, the guiding spirit in the colonization scheme. I know that Rosicrucianism today holds Bacon in highest esteem as an active transmitter of the secrets. Uh, if you go to the AMORC, the Ancient Mystical Order of the Rose and the Cross, the Rosicrucian Order Center in San Jose, Bacon is everywhere. Uh, he's, he's a, a demigod uh, in, in, in Rosicrucianism. But Bacon's influence was not confined to Rosicrucianism. He is considered by some to have been the first to formalize the mystery teachings into a system now recognized as modern Masonry. So Freemasonry up to that point had been very, very much involved with just the craft of building buildings. Um, it had been a guild in this country and each country had their own type of Masonry or Freemasonry. There was no sense of it being a worldwide fraternity where religious belief or race did not matter. For that had been very racial and very relig religious, but Bacon turned it into a, a truly international society. This international society would also come to the New World. And while Bacon's Rosicrucians would maintain a position of careful anonymity, the order of masonry would stretch its hands in America to the very heights of power. Nowhere is the Masonic presence more clearly seen than in the design of America's capital city, Washington, D.C. Yes, Washington, D.C. is completely uh, uh, based on, uh, on Masonic architecture. The whole architecture is laid out in an occult manner with Masonic symbology. Every major building in, the, in Washington, D.C. has a Masonic placard. I mean, the, the Masons have permeated and the other secret societies have permeated our society since the very beginning. In his book, The Secret Architecture of Our Nation's Capital, author David Ovison confirms the esoteric influence of masonry 
in the design and building of Washington, D.C. Ovison reveals the occult ceremonies surrounding the laying of the city's cornerstone, a ritual that involved the father of the nation, George Washington. 200 years later, in a ceremony commemorating this event, Senator Strom Thurmond, himself a 33rd degree Mason, is pictured alongside the cornerstone upon which is carved a Masonic square and compass. If you either look at the map of Washington, D.C. or try and drive in Washington, D.C., you think it must have been designed by a nutcase. But actually it was designed by a Freemason, a French Freemason named L'Enfant. Uh, I think Pierre Charles L'Enfant was his name. And, and it's full of esoteric symbolism. Ovison writes that, like the pyramids of Egypt, the entire city was built in alignment with the stars and suggest that the hidden purpose for the Masonic rituals is that America might be empowered by the gods of the ancient world. Can this be the reason for the pagan god and goddess images that have come to represent America? Tradition often claims that America was founded as a Christian nation only. But if this is the case, why are its symbols those of the pagan religions rather than images of Christ, the apostles, and stories from the Bible? Well, I think that this is where the great confusion comes in. Uh, America was founded as a Christian nation, but it was also founded as an occult nation. And there have always been two parallel forces here in America. One the Christian, one the occult, dating back into the 1600s. And until you understand that, you can't understand anything going on in the world. The Rosicrucians had long believed that powers and principalities from the spirit realm possessed secret knowledge that might be used for the benefit of mankind. These and other teachings were to be kept hidden from those considered profane and especially from the church. American Masonry today owes its allegiance to the very country it rebelled against. Modern Masons trace their official beginning to the United Grand Lodge of England, founded in 1717. The official start of modern Masonry is in 1717 in the Apple Tree Tavern in London, where the first Grand Lodge of England was convened. And that's called the Mother Lodge, because essentially all English-speaking lodges precipitate out of that. And for example, all American lodges, all the different Grand Lodges of the different states, all ultimately owe their allegiance and their warrant to the Grand Lodge of England. This image shows what appears to be a wizened old man passing a lamp in the dead of night to a younger man in Elizabethan clothing. Baconians believe this old world engraving represents Dr. John Dee passing the lamp of esoteric knowledge and wisdom to his successor, Francis Bacon. Both Bacon and Dee were men of science, dedicated to the advancement of learning. Both men were members of the Rosicrucian Society, of which Bacon would become the chief. Like Bacon, John Dee believed that America was indeed the lost continent of Atlantis. But where did he get this idea? Was it given to him by his angels? And did he pass this concept on to Francis Bacon? We can only speculate. But when Queen Elizabeth took the throne, the dream of colonizing this new Atlantis would come closer to being a reality. When Bloody Mary, as she was called, this was Mary Tudor, who had been now on the throne and persecuting the Christians, and she died perhaps ironically, with a false pregnancy. And so when she died in 1558, then after that, Elizabeth I came in as queen. And so uh, there were questions of what day should be chosen for Elizabeth's um, coronation. 
The coronation of a new ruler was an important event, the timing of which, it was believed, could determine the success or failure of a monarch's reign. To ensure her good fortune, Elizabeth called upon her old friend, Dr. John Dee. He was the Queen's astrologer, too. He, he computed the date for her to be crowned. And... Astrology in those days didn't mean necessarily what we understand it to mean today. Uh, there were some odd things about it, but there was a study of the stars, what we, that we would call today astronomy. So they had to know about the movements of the stars and the planets, and, and they were pretty knowledgeable about that. So it was a strange mixture of astrology and astronomy. So that's what he was doing. It's debatable how the efforts of Dee's astrology impacted the course of England. But when the new queen took the throne, it marked the beginning of an unprecedented era in English history. During this time, the language of the new world would be transformed, ancient knowledge would unfold, and the course of the philosophic empire would be established. The modern world would be changed forever, largely because of Queen Elizabeth I. And she was bright. This was Queen Elizabeth of England, one of the brightest queens that uh, England has ever had. Whether she was a true Christian or not was perhaps doubtful, but she, at least she did support the Protestant cause and not the Catholic one. The Queen's Protestant faith made her immediate enemies in Rome. In April of 1570, Pope Pius V issued a papal bull excommunicating her from, quote, the unity of the body of Christ. Well, that meant that the Pope was saying to all the Catholic kings of Europe, go and invade England, kill the Queen, take over the country, make it Catholic, and I'll give you my blessing. So that was a huge threat to England and the Queen. So the, the English, who didn't like that, <laughs> didn't like that idea, they, they formed a close knit protection around the Queen and their country. To answer the threat of spies and assassins from Rome, the English set up an intelligence network under the leadership of Sir Francis Walsingham, known as the Queen's Spy Master. Among his secret agents were Dr. John Dee and later on Sir Francis Bacon, along with their Rosicrucian Society which is said to have been formed in England for the purpose of protecting Elizabeth. But some suspect the Order of the Rose and Cross had yet another agenda. I think they would have definitely been on the, the Protestant side of things. They would have had a vested interest in using all of their both political savvy and occult savvy, savvy to protect the Queen. But I also think they had an esoteric agenda as well. This, this society had a very esoteric base. It, behind it, it had links with the wisdom societies, the wisdom traditions throughout Europe, and inherited a lot of that, that, that wisdom light being passed on. And so they had an inner program which was to try to raise consciousness of society. According to Bacon, Rosicrucianism seemed to represent the very heart and focus of the entire New Atlantis concept. Francis Bacon's last book that he was writing at the time when he allegedly died, that was 1626, but his last book was called The New Atlantis and the subtitle was The Land of the Rosicruce. Why the Land of the Rosicruce or Rosicrucians? Why did Bacon deem their influence to be so important? Rosicrucianism gets its name from the symbols, the main symbols used, um, and that's the rose and the cross. But these are very ancient symbols. They go back long, long, long way in time and been used by different societies for thousands of years. In the hands of different societies, the symbol has been interpreted in a variety of ways. There is the decipherment of the rose, that received much attention in Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. The rose is a symbol of secrecy and the term in Latin that uh, characterized the relationship of the rose to secrecy was sub rosa, meaning under the rose. So secret orders world round, uh, when they swear to secrecy, swear sub rosa. 
The secrecy of the rose represents the hidden knowledge of the ancient mystery religion, while the cross symbolizes Christianity. The combining of these two is what defines the belief of nearly all the secret orders. The symbology there is the infusion of all this Eastern Persian uh, uh, spirituality into Christianity. Was this fusion of beliefs a part of Bacon's plan? And what sort of impact could it have? The reformers argued that the mixture of paganism and Christianity is what produced the Dark Ages. Would Bacon's program of the Rose and Cross be a blessing or a curse? And how would this whole thing be carried out? When one follows the Rosicrucian trail, John Dee was a very, very key influence in the historical Rosicrucians, and some say even the, you know, the founder of it, the first president of it. The, but at some point, the, the presidency was given over to Francis Bacon, and he was in charge of the Rosicrucians, not just in England, but it spread right through Europe. My name's Shane Selway, I'm the Senior Deacon at Lodge Marlborough and tonight we're having a, a passing ceremony for one of our candidates to um, go to the next level in Freemasonry. Our candidate tonight is Evan, he's a lovely young guy who has um, been in Freemasonry for a, a short while and is doing very well, quite enthusiastic about the craft and really enjoying his time with us at Lodge Marlborough. Freemasonry appealed to me first because it's, it's good, it's just a group of guys that live up to a higher ideal. You can live your life the way you want to live your life, but uh, there's a lot of like-minded people here and it certainly helps. My role tonight is, um, as a senior deacon, to, to guide him around the, the lodge, make sure he feels very comfortable. When you're moving into a, a new degree, it's, it's another um, learning curve. That's, it's a degree in itself. We'll be teaching him some things at the next steps of Freemasonry, and uh, I should expect he'll very much enjoy it, but it should be new. Yeah, no, it was good. It was awesome. Yeah, it was an interesting journey. Uh, I definitely learned a lot in a very short space of time and I feel a lot close to everyone here as well. Now that that's all done, we're going to go across the road to the festive board, which is where we have something to drink and have something to eat. It's just the social part of Freemasonry, so it's the brotherhood part. So that's the best part. That's my favourite part. Oh, I get a lot of pleasure in, in seeing uh, Evan get through to the next sort of uh, degree of, of Freemasonry. Watching him learn about it is, is something that's special to me because it's me that directs him throughout the evening and it's something that I suppose stays with him and me for the rest of our, our Masonic career. So that, that to me is pretty special, I think. <laughs> 